Hi, welcome back to 101 Things. This is the third video in a series about building a very simple software defined radio using a Raspberry Pi Pico. If you haven't seen the other videos in the series, why not check them out? There's been a lot of interest in the radio since the last video, and there's been loads of improvements. I'd like to start by thanking everyone for their feedback and contributions. You've made the project so much better. Quite a few people have built this project now, and a few of them have been kind enough to send me photos. I'd like to start by showing you some builds, and then we'll take a look at all the new features and improvements. been amazed by the variety, so many different approaches. From minimalist builds using components on hand to professional looking builds with custom PCBs, there's been a lot of innovative new accessories as well, including antennas. If you've built a Pi Pico receiver, I'd love to see it. There's a link to the gallery in the description. If you've done a build, why not share some pictures? Okay, now that we've seen some of the great projects you've been building, Let's take a look at some of the new features. The OLED display is hard to beat for its low cost, low power and simplicity. But one of the most requested features is a larger TFT screen with a waterfall. A waterfall and spectrum scope make a great addition to any radio. And a larger colour TFT screen is certainly a nice accessory. For a lot of people, the simplicity of the receiver is part of the appeal. If you're looking to build a very simple receiver using an OLED display, don't worry, the basic circuit will still work right out the box. If you want to add a TFT display as an optional extra, it's a very simple upgrade. Just wire the display to the spare SPI port and then enable the display in the menu. I'm using an ILI 9341 display. They're quite easy to get hold of and they come in a variety of sizes. You need one with an SPI interface and make sure you check whether it needs 3.3 or 5 volts. There's quite a bit of variation between displays. I've had two identical looking displays that had different colours and rotations. I've added some menu options that allow the rotations and colours to be selected to suit. The SPI interface can create quite a bit of noise. I managed to remove most of the noise by keeping the supply and ground connections separate. Now let's look at some of the improvements to the software. I've had a lot of help with the software from contributors. I've had lots of pull requests with some really impressive new features. One of the most significant changes is the move to FFT based filtering. The FFT algorithm is computationally very efficient. For large filters it's actually faster to perform filtering by transforming chunks of data into the frequency domain, manipulating the spectrum and transforming it back into the time domain. This means we can implement much sharper, high performance filters without increasing the load on the processor. It also means that we've opened the door to implement more sophisticated non-linear filtering very efficiently. One example is the automatic notch filter. This is a way of removing interference and it's very effective if the interference is at a single frequency. The algorithm is very easy to implement in the frequency domain. It removes interference by finding and removing consistently high frequency components. This demo shows how it works. Another improvement is the implementation of synchronous AM demodulation. The existing algorithm used a simple approximation to estimate the signal magnitude from the I and Q component. Synchronous AM demodulation uses a phase lock loop to remove the carrier and precisely align its phase. When the PLL is locked, the I component contains the demodulated audio and the Q component is now zero. This demo shows the improvement to the audio quality. <laughs> The 
I think it sounds better because the carrier has been completely removed and we don't get any distortion from the magnitude approximation. Another new feature is IQ imbalance correction. This feature improves the rejection of image or mirror signals. The TALO detector actually does a good job of removing image signals. This is because the I and Q components allow the detector to distinguish between positive and negative frequencies. In an ideal detector, the image signals would be completely cancelled out. In the real world, it's not perfect though. The I and Q components aren't exactly the same magnitude, and the difference in phase isn't always 90 degrees. When the I and Q signals aren't perfectly balanced, the receiver lets some of the images through. Fortunately, we can measure the imbalance in software and correct for it. In this receiver, we've implemented an algorithm by Mosley and Slump, which presents a very efficient method of measuring and correcting for the IQ imbalance. I measured the image rejection in a receiver. Even without the IQ imbalance correction, the image rejection was actually quite good, but it wasn't perfect. I was able to hear some very strong local AM stations as images. With the IQ imbalance correction turned on, I wasn't able to hear the local stations as images anymore. I tried to measure the image rejection with the IQ imbalance correction turned on, but it was actually quite difficult. The images were either so small that I couldn't measure them, or they were below the noise floor. I think this is a pretty good result. In practice, we'll never be able to hear any image signals once we've turned on IQ imbalance correction. I've been wanting to implement USB audio for ages, so I was delighted when someone submitted a pull request. The USB audio uses the tiny USB library and is implemented using a standard device class. This means that the receiver shows up as a USB microphone on the host device. The nice thing about USB is that it's possible to implement multiple endpoints in a single device. This means that the receiver can support USB audio and cat control simultaneously using a single USB cable. It makes it much easier to set up radio software like FL Digi or WSJTX. There's no need to mess around with sound cards and the digital connection means there's no loss in audio quality. I'm quite excited about the possibilities. It should be possible to build a very simple headless receiver that can be remotely controlled by a laptop or smartphone. That should give you a taste of some of the new features, but there are loads more changes and improvements. We've made upgrades to the user interface, lots more configuration options and support for different hardware. If you'd like to know more about all the new features, or if you'd like to find out about the technical details, why not check out the documentation? There's a link in the description. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've got lots more upgrades and improvements to share, and lots of other projects in the pipeline. If you like that sort of thing, and you want to see more, why not subscribe? Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.